nice again. Thanks, buddy. That's an auspicious sign where I come from. It's a good sign. Right? The uh, Lakota have moved from calling me Wachishu to Hawkeye, so I, I'll take that. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. um, should we begin now? He's right there. Yeah, he's telling me to hurry up. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. He just showed up, too. All right. He's in that tree. Yep. He's watching. We humble ourselves before you. So, you know what? I yep. could live with that. I've had worse distractions. Yep. I, I kind of think it's a blessing. Yeah. I'm with you, brother. Here we go. I'm very happy. When I first heard you talking about this project, um, I was stoked for you all the way, but it was also something that was uh, kind of fast, loose, and out of control. Um, do you remember how we talked about it when we first were on the phone? I think so. I think when we started this project, we really went out with the idea that we were going to be collectors and we were going to have this basket. And because we really didn't run with a script, because it was really, as, as now you see, 18 or 19 months later, <laughs> that would have been impossible. Um, I just went out as a collector to grab what I could grab and put myself in the moment and put myself in front of the subject and just really see what I would get. I'm, I wasn't at that time as versed in the surfing world as I, as I am now, it's for certain, but uh, the first story was so unbelievable. There's not just one great apple on the tree, you know. Um, where did the expression that it just can't not do it come from? Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 I talked to you and I talked to a couple other close friends about it. And, and just the thought to me was, this is either the craziest thing I've ever done in my life or it's the most unbelievable opportunity I've ever been handed and gifted, you know, blessed with and just okay this feels really good it's I, it's got to be my heart you know I just got to give it to it <laughs> when you're in the you talked about the masters being in the presence of masters um, I don't know how many interviews you've done but uh, can you give me some of the things that stand out I mean last week we were at Jerry Lopez place and you were fairly glowing coming right off of that do you remember some of the the pearls yeah, um, right now we have done over 30 interviews. Uh, Paul Strau talking about the first time his dad took him out on a surfboard and the fish swimming underneath the board. And then it, these guys grew up in an era when there weren't surf shops. So if they wanted a board, it had to be made for them. And Tom Blake really of the highest standard of human being. Paul Strau talks about Blake building this guy's board for three weeks and Paul just sitting there watching. Um, Jerry Lopez last week talking about the face of the woman in the wave and that photograph and how they felt and how he felt when he was connected to that spirit in the water. Uh, Carl Ekstrom talking talking about fin design. He holds several patents and talking about fin design um, or tail tail of the board design. Billy Hamilton rubbing and working on the three thousand year old sequoia and looking down at it and going, look, this was Rome and this was. This was before that, you know, this was Greece, and this was here, and this was here. And 
their connection to the spirit of the tree that they're working with. Um, <laughs> Derek Dorner <laughs> talking about uh, riding a wave, and I, I remember in the interview, all of a sudden he started talking about this wave, and he was standing on the beach on the North Shore looking at that wave come in and knew exactly what was going on. He was not on a porch someplace. He was in front of that wave and he just completely stepped into it. And that kind of passion is very attractive. Contagious. Yeah. So we have an incredible uh, backstory on a, a town called Sochi in Northern California that was was a company town and the largest sawmill in the world and was was taken over and destroyed by some corporate raiding and how that how that town's rebuilt but we have all their historical images to work with it does seem like uh, you know this this never ending tale in terms of one leads to another leads to that's why it's uh, you know the the image that came up from going away from my first meeting with you guys was uh, Quixotic, right? You got tilting at a windmill and all this nobility, and then it's just, it's just never, there's always another windmill. Yeah. You know? The, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and the windmills aren't getting any smaller or any less important, you know, as, as we go down the line. And some of the, some of the stuff that's been said has really gone directly to the heart of the story. <laughs> it's very hard to have. <laughs> you guys put out the best stuff when I'm not recording, it kills me. This is the dilemma of a director. As you know. Yep, yep, yep. Once I roll like this, yep. then you can you can absolutely make the same comment, but it's always better under recording. And this is take four. Yeah, that was that was we we, we it's were It's all here, designed for. Here one night at a just a party and all of a sudden, they started to bless the Donald. Pahaku started to bless the Donald Takayama board, and it was just like, uh, "Turn on your camera, dummy! <laughs> you know, just turn on your camera. Just, just, just get this. You'll want this later. You know, this will be important to you later." So, but it, what is it designed for? I was going there. <laughs> Um, I'm like a pit bull with a pork chop. Yeah, 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 I gave you a little piece of steak, and man, that was just tasty, tasty. Uh, the whole concept of surfing is fun. It's designed for fun. Everything about the, everything about it, and all the bad, all the stuff that's before getting on the board and getting out there and being in the water, it's pretty tough to have a bad day surfing. I, you're a Southern Californian. I'm a Northern Californian, and I see waves almost every day and I see guys sitting out there in two and three foot waves going really yeah why not <laughs> you know and there's nothing else out here but me and this board and this and this wave and and what I'm doing so it's pretty hard of a bad time cue the garbage truck good morning my friend here we are in Newport Beach at the board club six years later what a journey it's been <laughs> We're at the board club in um, Newport Beach, where we premiered the film about 18 months ago, before COVID hit. Right before COVID hit. Then what happened? Nothing. So we took the time to. Well, let's go back a little bit. Yeah. Let's let, let's go back to when Tony and I did this interview first. We were six years ago, and boy, I thought I was almost ready to start um, start editing. I, I talked about editing in, in, in it. And one thing that's really been interesting about this film is it's been really organic in the way that it has presented itself. So without anything, it's changed. And we took that we took that first bit of I talked about being a collector with a basket and just going out and and getting whatever I could find and whatever happened. And as that happened, the story really developed to one about passion for what one does in life. And surfing was certainly a, uh, 
a catalyst and, and a focus point for it. But it really came to me to be more about loving what you do. Loving what you do. And at it, 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 the earlier interview, it, we weren't really sure what the film's name was going to be. We weren't really sure where we were going to go. We were filming in, um, on the North Shore in 2015. And in one of the breaks, I took a chance to go out and snorkel. And I was down about 12 feet in Turtle Bay, and the name of the film came to me. <laughs> so, Which was? <laughs> Addicted to Joy. And I shot up, to the, shot up to the surface and realized I didn't have anything to write it down with. And I was sure I was going to forget it by the time I got back up to my room. And here I am in the, this really luxurious resort. And, it, in Hawaii, and I'm like soaking wet, running through the thing, just trying to get to the elevator to get it down. Addicted to joy, addicted to joy, addicted to joy. And it really, it really opened it up for me to see that we could do that. Um, that five or six days in Hawaii, that night after it, um, after I'd come up with the name of the the film, I was staying at Derek Dorner's house sleeping under his drafting table. We'd kind of rolled out a little sleeping bag on the floor and I was sleeping under his drafting table and surfers kind of like to party and next door was a Hawaiian wedding with two DJs and they were about eight feet from where we were trying to talk in his house. It's a very small yard and everything and um, we were shouting at each other and just trying to figure out what you know what we were trying to say and I I went ah forget it and I I just kind of rolled over and and went to sleep and Derek said about 15 minutes after I went to sleep I woke up and I had a headlamp that I was using to find my way around his house at night and I reached over and I put the headlamp down I grabbed my notebook and I proceeded to write out the outline for the film and I was dead asleep. <laughs> you can believe that or not, but um, like a dream state. In a dream state, and uh, Derek, and, Derek, and Tiger Dorner were sitting there, and they said they were just their jaws were on the floor, and I didn't have any remembrance of it the next morning at all that I had done it. And the really unusual thing about it is I could read my writing, which when I'm writing and I'm, I'm getting ideas down, I write really fast and I leave off in, in letters and things. And it's really ridiculous to try and read it a lot of times. I can't read it again, but I could read everything that I had written. And that kind of... It was like it came from beyond. Divine, yeah, I was gonna say divine intervention. Was, you can't ignore that kind of, that kind of... You just can't ignore that kind of message. It's, and it's been that way all the way through the whole film. We've had these incredible messages and I think for a long time I thought I was making a film about something other than what I made a film about. And I think what I'm making a film about is myself. And I think when you really get down inside you and you really have to come up against some real difficult situations and really difficult decisions of how am I going to do this or what am I going to do here it's a real gut check and you know you make a documentary you don't make it for money you, you make it because you love it and you love what you're doing and um, that certainly was the case in this it just drew more and more and more out of me and every time I thought I'm stronger if I could ask something and I don't want to put words in your mouth but you set it up so beautifully um, if you would begin the sentence uh, if I began the sentence for you and you finished it with the first thing that came to mind and I said six years ago I thought I was finished making this film then life happened <laughs> so if I could prompt you just for the fun of it Start with six years ago. I thought I was finished making this film. Six years ago, I really did believe I was. I was close to editing and, and close to finishing collecting. And as things came up, interviews came up that I had never thought I would ever have 
opportunity to do, and I would never have, um, I would never have done if I, if I stayed really rigid in my ideas. I really had to learn to be an open book. I'm a pretty much of a control freak, and I really had to learn to say, okay, I'm just going to let this happen. Uh, for example, uh, when you say control freak, and it can be a good thing or a bad thing, but in terms of giving us an example, one example of me being a control freak would be? One example of being a control freak would be that I like to know what's going to happen. I like to know, you know, do I have all my gear here is am I am I ready to go I mean and can I control this or can I control that and one thing that the movie brought out is there is absolutely no control we have we have no control when we're when you're in 15 foot surf you have no control one example of no control outside of the surf was that you had a spontaneous if I remember right a blessing of a finished board and it was a gathering would you talk a little bit about just being a participant in that gathering and then getting the prompt, like, "Hey, it, 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 it's the scene. In, it's the scene in the film where um, everybody's kind of gathered around, and it's it's late at night. It it was a party, um, and people had consumed some things, and and there was a real interesting um, interesting vibe in the room. And Tom Pahaku Stone." Uh, Grandmaster, Polynesian, wizard, the authority shaman, shaman, was asked to bless a board shaped by Donald Takayama, and I was standing there in the middle of the circle with the circle, and all of a sudden went, I should record this. This is pretty important. <laughs> And I, it was just, I, I had a camera there and I, I, you know, you can't really set that kind of thing up. So you really have to give up the control of that situation and go to, okay, what am I going to do here? How am I going to make this work? I mean, you don't have audio, you don't have anything except what's happening in front of you at that moment. And um, I, I turn that into surfing. When you're sitting there, it's time to go. Nothing else. <laughs> Nothing else in front of you. All right. You described something really important to this, the essence of that last question I asked you. was like, six, year ago, six years ago, I thought I was done. And then uh, here you are. Like, I, I got this image from Easter that you're collecting Easter eggs in the basket, which, of course, is a film term about these precious things that are hidden. But as you uncovered things, um, the grapevine, started to hear what you're doing and everybody's related to somebody and connected through this passion uh, especially in the shaping community and suddenly you couldn't stop right could you talk a little bit about that connectivity where you know I worked with you with Jerry Lopez right and and at that time you already had an abundance but then it keeps coming it keeps coming could you it's like wave after wave because the knock-on effect of you having done the interview with Dorner or Lopez, and then other people who are in that, at that, on that frequency, right? Would you talk a little bit about that, that knock-on effect of one thing leads to the other, which is above and beyond your plan? I think you just have to remain, I mean, really have to remain open and free. You can't hold any idea Certainly there are ideas that you can hold and there are things that you can do, but you really can't hold on to anything when something really great is in front of you or an opportunity comes up that you've just not ever had before or you have the opportunity to talk to this person or that person yeah. or yeah. go have this experience, you know, uh, uh, to go sit in the shaping room with them and just, and just talk. How many times over the course of the, that, this last five, six years have we shared, uh, thanks to your sharing confidence in me, which I'm honored by, that you would say to me something like, it's too good not to do. So every time that you thought, okay, I've, I've reached it, I've, I've got the makings of the film, and then the next guru would appear, and you'd say, it's just too good not to, I have to. And so that, 
That expression, too good not to do. Tell me about too good not to do. Again, I think it's uh, being too good not to do, it's about your openness. And can you be fresh with a subject in front of you, especially with a documentary? Can you be fresh and say, this works or this doesn't? Mm -hmm. And if this is important, let's do it. Um, fortunately, we're in digital photography and we don't have to worry about processing and, and, and running 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter film. It's fairly inexpensive to do. I'm, there's travel costs and there's everything else, but you can pretty much do it until you run out of zeros and ones. And that gives you a lot of options for, it gives you a lot of options for places to go, but it also gives you a lot of options for things that you didn't expect. And it, one of the biggest messages of this film is everything is really connected. Yeah. One of the things about knowing you and, and, and loving you is that um, watching you go through this thing is very much the Joe Campbell hero's journey, right? You, I think, categorically might have even said about yourself that I was an outsider. What did I know about surfing? And now, like being in that sacred circle where the shaman blesses the, the board as a tribute to the shaper who's gone, right? That, that intimacy is an initiation. So I look at you now as somebody who's made the hero's journey full circle from outsider to participant to deep insider. Now you're the, the steward, right? The vanguard of like you just mentioned the ocean being something precious. Um, can you talk about how making this film has changed you? One of the things about knowing you and, and, and loving you is that um, watching you go through this thing is very much the Joe Campbell hero's journey, right? You. I think categorically might have even said about yourself that I was an outsider. What did I know about surfing? And now, like being in that sacred circle where the shaman blesses the, the board as a tribute to the shaper who's gone, right? That, that intimacy is an initiation. So I look at you now as somebody who's made the hero's journey full circle from outsider to participant to deep insider. Now you're the, the steward, right? The vanguard of like you just mentioned the ocean being something precious. Um, can you talk about how making this film has changed you? Making this film has, has, has really slowed me down tremendously. And trying to be thoughtful about everything that has been presented to me. Um, we had an opportunity a couple, three years ago to show this film to a very big LA producer. And he kind of liked it. And he helped us through a, a, a few incidents with it. At, at that point, we had. Um, we had a, it was, the film was an hour and 25 minutes long. And when he f saw it the first time, he said, where are the women? And he was right. Yeah. The, there were very few women involved in it um, because there was very few women involved in surfing at that time because the boards were big, the boards were heavy, they were hard to move. And it was a male dominated sport. It wasn't, it wasn't an open thing for women. And, he sent me out with that charge to go find, you know, find what was the, the female side of things. And out of that came an unbelievable interview with Joyce Hoffman, who was the first world champion, woman's world champion, and the first woman LA lifeguard, and, and just a complete groundbreaker in surfing, and with a completely different attitude, because Joyce wanted to compete where, there's all the Zen and all the, the voodoo of the magic of these magic moments and Last Light and Dawn Patrol and all that stuff. Joyce just wanted to be the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And she brought a completely different attitude with it. And the other woman that's featured heavily is uh, Kathy Conner, who was the, whose father wrote the book Gidget. And to realize that this person was there in 56 and 57 and there was maybe two girls on the beach and mm -hmm. the rest were men and, and to have that opportunity to watch somebody who really started the billion dollar surf industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they legitima legitimized it. So what I'm, I'm hearing word. from you is, is that uh, it ended up being essential to remain open even when you had a very strong idea about what this thing is and what you want it to be, that, that the thing you learned was to remain open to other people 
suggesting a way to improve it or, or to open it up to something bigger. Um, what would you call that characteristic, that, that openness, if you had to say it another way? Is it putting your ego aside, or how, how do you describe that? I, 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 really, I really don't know, because it, 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 putting that being open, it, it's such a simple word. And we attach all this baggage to it, and really it comes down to the simplicity of being present yeah. every moment. You know, and that's certainly been a, a major message for me in the film, and especially in editing, when I found things that I didn't realize that we'd actually had been said. Uh, magic really, really came to happen. It, it, at one period of time, the interviews were happening so fast, I didn't get a chance really to log them. And I've really paid the price in time on that non-logging, but um, you mean transcripting them? Yeah, uh -huh. and and sitting down and spending some time with them because I didn't have the time to do it. We were right. going to do another one, and we were going to do another one. So it's just like filling up the vessel until it just couldn't hold up anymore. Right? Would you describe that as finding buried treasure in post-production? Absolutely. Okay, so repeat the Absolutely. premise of the question. There's, there's so much buried treasure in, in, in post-production. Um, when, when you're present with someone and it's happening, you really are focused. I, I, I went into the interview with Billy Hamilton with 12 pages of notes. And in the first three seconds of the interview, he said, I've been thinking about this a long time. I think I'll talk. And I just had to realize that I had to throw those notes out and just listen to what was happening in front of me. And and then going back and, and rediscovering and refinding what was there. And it's allowed us to create all these individual interviews over the film. I, I really love uh, the section with Billy especially, and that spontaneity is there. And it's, um, this is uh, another aspect of the thing affecting you as a storyteller, is that literally letting go so you did the work, you prepared, you were diligent, you disciplined, and you got 12 pages of notes because you're thorough. If you had been attached to that and had resisted the idea, you wouldn't have what you got with him. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have if I, if I, have, if I had been rigid. And if I had been it, attached. It, yeah, yeah, yeah if, I, if I had said, no, this is what I want to go to. One thing that was really important for me from the very beginning was these guys are, this is their life's work and I'm gonna take it and move it down to a three second or a five second or a 10 minute sound bite, five minute sound bite, two minute sound bite. So I was really, really, really aware of that. And being flexible in those situations certainly gave me a lot more material to work with. As someone who sat at the feet of these uh, acknowledged masters, um, what's the golden thread that you witnessed in person that runs through all of their stories or their, their characters? What's the, what's the golden thread? If yeah, the golden thread that runs through everything is the water and their love and their incredible desire to do what they wanted to do with their lives. And again, to be present. You know, when this, when this thing started, it was 112 pound surfboards. And all of a sudden, World War II happens, and then there's balsa from life rafts, and then all of a sudden, somebody says, well, you know, they made all this stuff called foam for the airlines, you know, for, for the airplanes. And here, you figure it out. You know, we don't know, it, it, we don't know how you're going to do it, but you got to figure out how to make a surfboard out of this right. kind of thing. And it, it, was, it was a probably from the late 40s, to the mid 60s was a very 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 explosive concentrated focused time but that golden thread was the smile that they all had they all loved what they did and and if you were to say that the uh, i like to say that they're masters right master shapers master ar uh, artists of uh, they what are would, what, would, what would you say um that you took away because if you're the pilgrim going to the mountain to see the guru and sitting with the the master what did you learn from these masters the thing i learned from these masters was 
the thing I learned from these masters was humility, passion, focus, um, joy. compassion, respect, fear. It comes down to some pretty raw emotions. And yet, you're finding, after one incredibly bad screening, where we were supposed to show the film at one o'clock in the afternoon and we had driven down on a holiday weekend and at four o'clock, the person still, the people still weren't there. and the place we showed it, the guy had a bird and the bird was all over the house and it was so bad I couldn't plug in a monitor. <laughs> and at 6.30 these people finally showed up and they were drunk. <laughs> and it was just a completely useless adventure and a completely useless trip. And I decided to drive home from San Clemente back to Monterey that night and stopped along the way and I spent the whole night pretty much on top of the car, looking at the sky in Santa Barbara and rethinking where I was at on this whole process. And about 5.30 the next morning when I got up to head home, the, the person I was with, we stopped for gas and he came out of the, the gas station and said, yeah, this kid in there, he's just really crazy. And I, I went in and I said, so, this guy says, you're crazy. I said, why are you doing this job? And he said, I do this job for one reason. He said, I do this job so I can surf. Mm -hmm. He said, I work from 3.30 in the morning until 8 o'clock, and I'm done, and I'm out, and I'm in the water. And I do this job so I can surf. That's what it's about. And that restored you? Absolutely. It, it, it brought me, it, his, his story brought me so much belief in what I was doing at that point to just say, you never know where the angels are gonna come from. And that one came out of the middle of nowhere after two ridiculously hard days. And the joy and the expression of this kid, it was just, you want that juice as part of your life. As a reflection upon, uh, again, something I really admire about you of, of many things, is that you just never quit something that it had so many obstacles and adversity, known and unknown, and, and roadblocks and, you know, junctions. For the sake of future storytellers who are looking at this and, and don't know all that backstory, to know the behind the scenes craziness and politics and all that nonsense, what would you impart to young Jedis anywhere in terms of how, how to learn how not to quit? What did you What did you do to learn? I, 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 to, to learn not to quit. I, I, the only thing that you learn is not to do it. Because if you stop, you're on a different game. But if you don't quit, and a lot of times you have to give yourself the space, especially in editing, especially in 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 that process, you have to give yourself the space to accept the fact that you didn't get anything done today, that maybe what you did was develop some ideas for later. And I'm really, I'm really results driven as a human. And you really want to see those numbers go up at the end of the day. And it was really, it's really been a part of me to get it, to get it there to say, nope, let's get the right thing. How did you learn to, to be kinder to yourself in that process? Uh, I, I don't think you can be kind to yourself. I think I, I've hated myself a bunch of times. And, and I, I think at some point you just have to go, I'm not in charge here. I know who's in, I, I'm not in charge here. I'm the steward of this project. I am, I, am the, I, am, I am the keeper of this flame. And for some reason it's been gifted to me. I don't know what that reason is yet. But if it's to tell this story, I'm there. Now, I am observer of things, and maybe you've noticed as well, uh, that the moments that you touch on the most transcendent things, these veils become animated. 
<laughs> there's a cause and effect. <laughs> I'm like, strong indication that uh, the that juice is working. Yeah. Um, I also want to include uh, Devin here to ask anything that you might have thought coming up because you're you're not just a, a trained monkey back here. You're a participant and a waterman yourself. Do you have any questions for Richard? I know it's a little bit vague, but but why the water? Why do you feel like it is the water that that creates that that joy that that brings everyone in and why is that the centerpiece uh, than any other element? I, I I think that I think the water is is the the focal piece because of the life giving properties that it, that it, that it has and the mystery that it unfolds. We can't see what's below the surface. We can see what's above the surface. We have no idea what's below the surface. Could be 40 whales dancing in a circle right below us and we have no idea. It's magic. Uh, it, there's power there. You you certainly learn respect from the water and you you learn how important it really is. And you learn maybe it's not the day to go in the water. Maybe it's the day to just sit on the beach and watch. So is it along the lines of something so much more powerful than me that, that, that uh, we find our place in, in the smallness of the vastness? And that's a we great are, question, Dev. We are humbled in the, in, the, in the water. It's not where we belong. And to go to that environment, it really is beyond, beyond words that there is this majestic, beautiful thing that is constantly changing in front of you. There is no static to it. It is constantly changing. It is constantly moving. As our lives are, as the planet is, as everything around us is constantly in motion. We're just viewers. Sometimes we're lucky enough to be participants. Yeah. Or we just go through with scabs and 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 broken bones yeah broken bones and and no appreciation of what we've been given and as a, a participant observer with you on this thing and um i'm reflecting about how it's built up on itself as a mosaic of stories so if it's like zen which is impenetrable you can't talk about zen like you can't talk about fight club this is also something that's hard to talk about and yet you've, you've built this mosaic out of these master shapers and the stories that it's got a holistic collective beauty. Um, I've, when people ask me about this film, I tell them it's a love letter. The film, the film to love story to, to a way of life and, and to these people that have done it and to myself for being strong enough to not give up. Um, certainly eight years of self-financed filmmaking um, can give you plenty of reasons to give up. It's just a road that you take. Either do it or don't. But it was too good not to do. It was too good not to do. I know that there's a better world if we want to embrace it. We have to, it's a choice. It's really a choice. Um, happiness is a choice. Um, you can look at something and say it's either the worst thing that's ever happened or the best thing that's ever happened. And, you know, train every day, leave in either way. If you stop, then you got to find something else to do. Maybe that's another reason not to stop, is I'm kind of afraid to stop because I don't know what I'm going to do after I'm done with this. But we'll see. You know, uh, I use the expression about flirting with an idea is like uh, getting pregnant with the idea. That you know it, that the bump is showing and the baby's coming like this film is birthing and you're going to love that baby whether or not it has all its fingers and toes yep. or imperfect or perfect but now that you're at this the birth moment the birth moment <laughs> <laughs> putting it out into the world does it feel like being a parent oh uh, i've never been fortunate enough to be a parent yeah but um i'm sure it does and it's made me kind of wish that i had been a parent because probably would have already known the lessons that I had to learn in bringing up in bringing up addicted you know and getting it to school and on time and making sure that that mm -hmm. um, it had a well-rounded life it's a pure pleasure to sit here with you and and have this small part yeah. in experience with it and uh, 
When, 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 they, when, when we started talking about doing behind the scenes interviews, I, the, the only person that I wanted to, <laughs> to, to, to have you do this was you and uh, uh, Tony, you've been a, such a, a, a focusing force. You've been there a lot when I have had, had to say, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what's next. I really don't know what's next. Yeah. And there's certainly been seven or eight of those moments <laughs> on this, on and this project. Got, and you got through every one of them. You That's got the thing it. you learn as you live. You know, you either live or you die. <laughs> and, and if you live, it's just making it better. Uh, with the good stuff that you've touched on here, I'm surprised that the whole thing didn't blow over the table. Yeah, Because you have, you have been drawing them the mana, right? Um, what a pleasure to be asked to be Thanks. doing this with you. Thank and you, you can count on me anytime you want to do that. Thank you. Right? From here on. Thank you. It's a standing invitation because uh, I personally would feel slighted if you didn't ask me. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add? I have a question that I'm not totally sure how to phrase it because, you know, the title Addicted to Joy. I listened, it was either a podcast or a book semi recently about. Um, you know how surfing can save so many people from these addictions they have in their life but that it also in a sense parallels an addiction <laughs> some of these surfers who, who were saved by surfing in the end also end up succumbing in a sense because they that addictive personality that ability to surf 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 sort of translated into sticking with the drugs that they couldn't get off and i, I just wonder where does it sit in that realm for you with the title Addicted to Joy? I had this conversation with, with Paul Strau, who gave me Hawaiian name, by the way, which was, was an unbelievable honor. It's a two-edged sword. The word addicted is a two-edged sword. It's either a good thing or a really bad thing. And I think when we start tagging joy with it, it becomes a good thing. I'm with you on that. I think of all the, the vices, this is probably one of the best. Um, and anything extremes in my book is going to be, you know, questionable. But I have carried this title with me since you've shared it, and and even asked your permission to borrow it on occasion, right? And and um, to Devin's question, I I think that um, at the risk of, you know, triggering thoughts about, well, yeah, this uh, addiction is is uh, potentially fatal. But in terms of being addicted to joy, what a way to go. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times, maybe you've had the same experience where it's glassy, smooth, and possibly beautiful, and the horizon's infinite because you can't tell the difference between the skyline and the waterline. And, and I've turned, because I always surf with my brother, and I said, you know, I could go today, it would be just fine. And if that's the way I'm going to go, that's an addiction that I, I would say is an acceptable one. But uh, I don't mean to answer your question. No, but I think when we come to that point in all of our lives, you know, yeah. that's the that's that's where the freedom is. Yeah. You know, is I'm gonna be happy. Self determined. Yeah, self determined. Beautiful.